Our next session is um, specific voices, and I'm really excited about our panel. We again have Mr. Tim Goodman here from The Hollywood Reporter to be our moderator, and I just want to encourage you to please tweet along the way using the hashtag VIPIndustry. Thank you. Oh, great. So it's uh, false to me to introduce everybody. This is, a, this is a great panel. Also, you'll find out soon that we're all in different stages here, or these gentlemen are in different stages of the, uh, their shows and production. But um, just want to preface it for those of you who were here uh, in the last session. You'll hear this again. Uh, we are in a kind of amazing times and scary times for people like this who make television. Uh, we are platinum age of television, and we have 400 scripted series out there right now in prime time, and it's staggering to think about uh, for people to watch, but for on this end, for these guys to make shows uh, and have them stand out and, and, and find an audience and then retain that audience is, is, is an amazing challenge. So, uh, but I want to introduce everybody. So from my left, uh, this is Warren Littlefield, executive producer of Fargo. And I think we're going to show a clip of that. Well, this is a deal. Hank's thinking botched robbery. Oh, sure. That's how it starts, with something small, like a break-in at the Watergate Hotel. But this thing's only getting bigger. G-53. Hon? Judge, huh? So less likely a robbery got bad, more likely a judge-specific beef. Mm -hmm. Judge Munt. <laughs> Which brings us to the shutter, and where'd he go? There's a man. Everything okay, you mom? Your son's wanted in connection with three murders. And? Get him out of here. Where's your little brother? Who knows with that kid? Probably neck deep in some pussy. So I'm getting excited about that seminar. The witch? Life spring. Everybody's doing it. Got us a room at the Sheraton. I don't know if we're saving up right now so I can buy the butcher shop. We got a plan, you know? The word we is a castle hung with a moat and a drawbridge. Don't get prisoner or we. Find him. Where's my brother? Are you listening to me? Is he listening to me? He cut off his ears. He's dead. I think. I want to be the best me I can be. We're very friendly people. I'm not afraid of a war. Watch your toes now. I got a nephew with a palsy arm. She's tough, but, you know, a girl. I'll give you a kiss. I am not You just described the state of Minnesota. This has been a minor miracle. The two men could stand on a lonely road and talk. So anybody who was here earlier in the panel and heard all those mean things about me, I fucking love the show. So. <laughs> I watched all four episodes here in Canada. I wrote my review last night, so I'm not all I'm not super mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, so next to Warren is uh, Christopher Ro uh, Rogers. Want the C in there too, Christopher C. Rogers, who's the co-creator, executive producer of Halt and Catch Fire, uh, AMC, and we also have a clip of that. Sitting on a gold line. But we haven't put anything out in six months. This computer you sold us are counterfeit. It doesn't matter. I got a fix for you. With your checkered work history, you don't have a whole lot of options. He hacked into our network? He's even still logging on. You call this a company? More like Nightmare on Nerd Street! I should be the boss. Someone should be. Halt and Catch Fire. Season premiere Sunday, May 31st, only on AMC. Nice. 
I also like Halt and Catch Fire, so look at that. We've got a trend going here. Uh, and on the end here, we have... Uh, <laughs> Oh, you know I love it. Come on. I didn't get to review it, so he's happy about that. But I, I, I actually do like it. Simon and I have had this conversation many times. So on the end, we have uh, Simon davis Berry, who's the creator, uh, executive producer of Continuum. We have a clip, too. We're trapped, Kira. Every choice that we make leads to a different outcome. We keep getting confronted by the futures that we create terrified of making everything worse. I have faith in you, Alec. Nice. So, uh, it's what I mentioned earlier about this, these three gentlemen, there are th uh, three different stages uh, of their shows. Simon's uh, at the end wrapping up a show he's been involved in for a really long time, and that's a specific task in itself uh, for a writer and a creator. Um, and Christopher is in a particularly interesting position because uh, Halt and Catch Fire hasn't been picked up for the third season, but he might find out today. <laughs> Uh, which is, and also we will revisit this. Uh, he's, it's one of the rare instances in a television environment like this where uh, a show comes out, it gets, I think, mostly favorable reviews. Uh, it's just, for some people, they didn't get to it, they lost it or, or, or whatnot. And then the second season has a huge, much more positive critical response and a, and a, and a real push from uh, viewers and critics alike to have it renewed. So that's, that's so rare in this environment. Um, and then uh, for Warren, coming off I, what was arguably one of the great TV events of 2014, in which was the first season of, season of Fargo, uh, and he's sitting uh, um, maybe just less than two weeks away from the season two, uh, so everybody's in a, in a, in a different position here. Uh, but I do want to go just throw it out for you guys. In this environment where we have all these shows, uh, it's so hard to actually have a voice that stands out and uh, to have a show that can stay on the air, to get on the air and stay on the air. So I guess because Halt and Catch Fire is right in the, on the precipice, tell me, tell me how well, your thoughts are on this environment and what it's like to be a creator. Um, you know, this is a unique time, uh, I think, for shows like Halt and Catch Fire, which is about the dawn of the personal computer era. It's a, it's a period show and nobody has a gun. Um, <laughs> I think they've kind of shown the, the shows that can draw live viewers, the shows that people feel like they really have to see. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, Fargo, shows where people die, shows where you're really worried about it being spoiled for you. Uh, so Halt and Catch Fire is a show that nearly triples on the plus threes, which is people that watch it within three days on DVR and the plus sevens. Um, and I think it's because it's a show people feel like they want to binge or catch up on, on their timetable. but. Uh, when you don't have live viewers, that sends a message to the network that they have to take alongside that data and kind of make a decision about, you know, uh, what makes sense within their business model. So while we were a successful show critically, um, we weren't much watched live. Uh, and so, so I think this is a time when networks are deciding what matters to them out of those two kind of rubrics. Yeah, I mean, and one of those is, as you ta talked about, and some of it's, uh, especially for AMC in the States, part of it is, is sort of a prestige model. Um, where you could be, you know, you get critical acclaim, you could get Emmys, and it's we're in a whole new world where, where Warren, if you don't know, ran NBC for many years when NBC was number one, which was a, I mean, a long time ago for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ever since he quit, it really went in the gutter. But uh, Thank you. it's true, actually. And uh, so in those days, it was all about overnights and ratings and stuff, and now we judge shows on completely different, different level. Um, absolutely. It, it's also... Once upon a time, Tim, uh, a pitch was a writer and an idea. Um, and that just doesn't exist anymore. Um, in a world where there's over 400 scripted original series across all of these platforms, it's really about IP that has um, a luster to it, 
um, a, uh, Simon and I are working on uh, going out on a project together um, that are three best-selling novels, a, a trilogy of novels um, that has its own heat to it. And you're really um, building packages and the architecture and the, the shaping of that pitch um, can easily take a year um, of, and, and usually these days involves an Oscar winner, um, because heaven forbid you pitch without an Oscar winner these days. Um, and, and so you really, really need those kinds of big elements to get their attention in the marketplace. And because everybody wants to be in television. It, yeah. This is a wonderful, wonderful time to be able to explore character and take a, take a journey with narrative that we've never been able to do in this medium before. So who doesn't want to play in it? Um, so a lot of people are out there buying. There's over 60 places that make original content. But um, it's gotten a little crazy in what you need as a showrunner, as a creator, as a producer, what you have to architect, the patina, so that it can break through that clutter. And then if you do it well, you know, we got, we got Fargo. Right. And, and, um, but I don't know in this environment, um, you know, Noah Hawley was not a household name. Um, uh, we did have a revered property, um, and, uh, and we had John Langraff who embraced it, uh, and thank God. But in today's world, it's only gotten tougher in terms of what you have to put out there. And, and Simon, when you're, you're at the, you know, the, you've got Continuum, and, and you did it, and now you're moving on. And so I, I want to circle back later about how you wrote for, for the ending. But also, do you think, because you're about to launch this new thing, obviously, but uh, when you compare what it was like back then, launching and, and c coming up with the idea for a continuum and then what it is now, how has it changed? It's interesting because in the last four years of production, we've watched this transformation happen. The year we did continuum, first season of continuum was the year House of Cards came out. So it was a fascinating time to witness this shift while you were in the middle of making a show because really the f it did feel like the world was shifting underneath us. In fact, from season one to season two, even on our show, we got completely different marching orders from the network. Season one, they were like, push the procedural. Season two, they were like, push the serial. <laughs> and that's really hard to do when you're kind of committing as a storyteller. You, you, I wanted to do a serialized show, but they wouldn't let me when I sold it. Um, but I was happy to adjust the show. But it's not good for the show sometimes to do that. And we certainly, I think, may have lost a chunk of our audience because we made this quite dramatic shift away from procedural towards the serial part. But the serial parts of the show were already there. We just exploited them. Right. Um, and then looking out at the world and seeing it shift, I was kind of just glad I was working on a show and not selling at that point because I really did feel intimidated by what it would be like to be out there selling and pitching, which I had done for a decade prior to Continuum. So I was pretty good at it, but uh, I didn't get it yet. And I think now it's a little clearer as to targeting your buyers and knowing that certain stories are not going to work for everyone and you really need to be a curator almost. Uh, well, when you came up with this, this next project, I mean, what, what were you looking for for source material or, or how did you know you, what, 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 did you, what were you thinking you had to pick to, to even make it, to get your head out of scene? Yeah, it's a combination of developing your own material but also being open to material coming to you and certainly as uh, uh, someone who's known for science fiction, it was uh, in my interest to be open to some of the books and the properties, the IP that's out there for sci-fi, because it is very rich and it's only starting to be exploited uh, appropriately. And I think TV has um, evolved to the point where it can do service to great books now that it couldn't do before. So um, I actually, <laughs> it's just, this is a typical Hollywood story. I'm sorry, I, you can't learn anything from this. <laughs> I, I ran into Eric Balfour at a Mexican restaurant in LA. Uh, Eric. This is very important for you to know this. <laughs> Eric had reached out to me because he was a fan of Continuum and he wanted to develop a completely different idea. I had uh, politely declined. And then I ran into him in person and so we had a quick chat and he said, oh, I'm so glad I ran into you. I have these books. And I was like, 
I love it. Let's call, call me and let me know. And next thing I know, I'm talking to Warren, and MGM buys the books, and 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 so we're on this track. Um, that's I could say 50% uh, of what happens to me is in Mexican restaurants, <laughs> not minding my own business as a metaphor for how, sometimes how things happen. But you know, th that's how things happen sometimes. You, you have to be open and you have to have a plan. And I, I looked at the books and I immediately saw, oh, this is a potential uh, path. Well, for people who don't know, what books are we talking about? Uh, can I, am I allowed to? Sure. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a trilogy called The Starbound uh, Trilogy. The book is called, the first book is called These Broken Stars. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's a, it's a, a young adult series, uh, but it's very sci-fi. It's very much in the world of, of uh, deep space and big themes, epic operatic story with a very Shakespearean core that's really about a daughter and her father and that relationship. And, and Warren, speaking of this, the topic here of specific voices, I mean, you were, you guys were adapting a known quantity, which was is normally a good thing, but when it's the Cohen brothers, everybody's like, why would you even bother? So the odds were kind of stacked against you then. And I think that's what you said, Tim. Yeah, I did. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did say that. Yeah. But um, that was before I saw it, though. That's like, right. Why are you guys doing this? Uh, but in, now you, you've, because it's a limited series or more accurately, more like an anthology. You've uh, you and Noah have come into the second season, and you're ba you're setting it in 1979. You're completely shaking things up. So creatively, how how is that? How do you manage that? Um, well, we make it as hard as we possibly can. Um, and and look, with most television series, you I think as producers and and writers, you look at what you did over the course of a season and you give yourself a full creative report card. Here's what we learned. When we put these two people together in this story, there was magic, magic that we perhaps never envisioned previously, but that's one of the wonderful accidents. So you learn, you grow, you look at the set that you're using and you make improvements and you expand and you do all those things. We pitched this as an anthology and we don't get to do any of that. We're making a 10 hour movie, um, a new movie each year we do Fargo. Um, and we felt for that property um, that that way we could honor what the Coens created with that movie. And we imagined that you could walk up to a large bookshelf um, and pull a book off of it and it would say, true crimes of the Midwest. And, and if you opened up that book, that there'd be a chapter and that would in fact be the Coen Brothers movie, it would, would be part of that. And season one would be another chapter. And season two is in fact another chapter and that they're all connected in tone, they're connected in that dark, wonderful, and wildly funny, hopefully when we're on our game way, um, so we honor the Coens, and, and year one we teased a little bit of the mythology of Buscemi's suitcase full of money, um, and in year two we really tell the story of Lou Salverson, um, and only instead of Keith Carradine, um, a 70-year-old uh, actor, we have a... Um, we have a 35-year-old actor in Patrick Wilson who is playing that role, and he hinted about uh, the massacre at Sioux Falls, the time where he stared at evil, um, and um, and that's what we decide to do. So we 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 have links, um, but we really start from scratch, and that's uh, a wonderful, crazy challenge for us um, in this world of television. And Christopher, uh, what I what I really loved about Halt and Catch Fire and what you were able to do in the second season was, you, uh, you probably didn't read any of the press or anything of like that, or even just the fans who were reacting. It's like there were so many people who wanted you to go in different directions or wanted you to be more, or came into it at the end and said, "This is great. Let's. What do you do next?" And how you were managed to do, like I hinted at earlier, sort of the uh, almost the impossible is get a second act, get a second chance, and, and really nail it. And then when did you guys know that? that you were sort of reinvigorating the show? Um, you know, I think when you write a pilot, you're, especially now, you're engaged in this huge act of brinksmanship, which is like, what is the craziest, most intense corner I can write myself into to sell this? 
and then you go to uh, you know episode two, and it's like, what do we do now? Uh, you know, and, and so I think absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So so I think the first season of a show, a lot of times you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the show is. You know, you think you have an idea, you write a Bible, but then you cast it, you you people it with real actors, you you put a writing staff around it. Um, and Halt and Catch Fire, I think, is a show that I'm immensely proud of the first season, but spent some of its first season kind of finding itself. Uh, and I think by the end of that season, we knew what it was. And so when we came back for our second season, as you said, we, we knew it worked. We knew what we wanted to see more of. Uh, you, there were just parts of it that felt good when they were happening when we were getting the dailies. And you write to those. You know, if you're smart, you treat it like a living organism uh, and, and kind of channel more energy into what's working. And, um, you know, that people responded to it critically was awesome, but I, but I, it's more of a feeling in the room of like, yeah, this is good, this is breaking easy, this is surprising, this feels vital. Um, so I'd love to say there was there was some great stunt we were aware of, but uh, I think it was just kind of our own happiness with the story as it unfolded, and, and that proved telling and was kind of an atmosphere that, that spread to production as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it is kind of amazing that we're kind of sitting here and he hasn't had the call yet for season three because it's, and, and by the way, Simon said he should put his phone on here and just let it ring and then we all take the call in here and then we could all shout, pick it up. Um, can we just tweet out, like, can we put it out live from VIFF that we want Halt and Catch Fire, we want another year. Like, let's put I'm that I'm not going to stop you guys if you need to do that. now, yeah. right now, I think the audience has spoken. That's right, and they're, and they're sitting at AMC and they could, they could do it. I, I think that would be great, I think absolutely. Because it it, from a storytelling perspective, it is really hard to do. By the way, it works. We, we had our fans in season three, we activated them to give us our final season. And they, I think, scared the network a little bit because they started saying things like, we're not gonna watch Outlander yeah. <laughs> if you don't renew Continuum. <laughs> and I got a call from, the, from one of the network executives going, you have to control these people. And I was like, I can't control these people. <laughs> like, they're, they're, they control themselves. And it's like, well, you can't have this negative stuff about our other shows. And I'm like, that's not on me. Like, you gotta, you gotta deal with the fans you've activated. Death threats also work. Uh, <laughs> when I was at a network, um, I, would, I would get, I, I, had, I had one show where um, a crate of lilies, white lilies, would come each day to the office. <laughs> and there was no note, no nothing. It was just white lilies every day. And then finally, at the end of a week, it was, you better keep this show on. And I was like, oh, or I'll be buried underneath those lilies. And so, you know, threats, whatever it takes. Right, we actually Passion have a, uh, from an audience is critical. Did yeah, it work? We, yeah. yeah, it did. That was, that, was, that was totally not me, by the way. <laughs> we actually have a campaign going right now where, um, based on a scene from the first season, uh, people are writing these letters to the network executives and then like smearing a little bit of ketchup on them because it's, you know, evocative of a scene from the first season. But I think some people are overdoing it, and I think ketchup looks a lot like blood. Uh, <laughs> so while I would say that I appreciate the efforts immensely, uh, I, I think there is maybe a line we're crossing with AMC, and we need to. Uh, yeah, just, I was kidding. Just about temper the, the dosage. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe your fans should say we, we won't watch *Fear the Walking Dead* if we don't get Halt <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Catch Fire back. Um, but uh, Simon, you, were, you you did your people did rally to 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 get it back, but. Um, yeah, I'm wondering how, just to talk about writing, how did you approach that font when you did get this last season? How did you approach it? And how do you, what's the mindset of saying, okay, I created this thing four years ago and now I'm going to wind it all down in, in a way that hopefully those outspoken fans will be happy about? It, it's a great question because you are, you're in this uh, very impossible situation at a point. At the end of season three's broadcast, we knew we were uh, on this bubble, as it were. And I think the, um, the intention was, we're just gonna keep trucking and assume the best. But you do, in the back of your mind, you don't know. And Chris is sitting here right now in the same place. Um, but at a certain point, when it takes too long, when it goes on and there's no no, and ultimately, no no is, is the best thing because a bad, a, uh, a bad news usually can travel quite quickly, but this vacuum, for me, just was I was very optimistic. I was like, well, if, if we're not hearing anything, that's probably a good sign. So I started horse trading with the broadcaster immediately and saying, I get the position you're in. You don't want to spend all this money. You're feeling the show isn't isn't uh, making uh, money for you. Fine, but at the same time, you don't want to piss off the fans, and you've got this um, business model. So let's let's see. Let's think about all the all the iterations of 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 how we can do this the way that works for both of us because I don't want the show canceled outright where I don't get to write an ending 
and you don't want to spend a ton of money to service this. So we kind of, I, th I mean, we threw a lot of ideas around, but the one that obviously stuck was this shortened season. Um, and for me, creatively, it meant I could throw out this typical 13 episode structure of having to service multiple storylines and episodic storylines within the season. And I thought, I can just do a six hour finale, is in my head. I'm going, I can write one story, six hours, I can end the series on my terms and if I get that shot. And the network at that point was feeling, well, we don't need to service the episodic part because we're not no longer looking for the ratings to justify keeping the show on the air, which is where they push that procedural component. So it was, it was actually a very, I think, mutually beneficial process where the network spent half as much as they were going to. Um, they didn't alienate the fans who turns out did show up and watch Outlander, so they were happy. And I got to write a six hour limited series, which I always wanted to do, um, and end the show on my terms as opposed to this. Uh, and yeah, you, you, I could have run the show probably three or four more years and found storylines, but ultimately I would have traded two more seasons for the opportunity to end it my way exactly. in half a season, any day. And I think I would say the same thing moving forward. I think it's, it's much better for the fans yeah, to have closure. Yeah, absolutely. I speak. I I totally believe that. And I and Chris, I think you, uh, there was a general consensus that it ended in a way that was satisfying, but also left the door open for a third season. Yeah, I I, I think that's. I mean, and this is just personal philosophy, but I think that's a little bit your responsibility as a dramatist is that I like shows that give me a little bit of closure at the end of each season. So while you want to suggest where you're going, I think, it always feels more kind of emotionally satisfying to me to to wrap it up in a way. Um, but we've gone in and we've pitched a third season. I mean, we think we, we have the runway and a story that's worth telling. But at the same time, I, I do. I think you owe it to your fans. They have relationships with these people, and, and they want that, if not closure, some satisfaction. And uh, so we, we tried to give it there. Yeah, and Warren, you're, you're in a different position uh, where you sort of got over that expectation hurdle, but then you it, it worked so well. And then you're sort of recreating things, setting it in a different era. Did you ever... You and Noah like think about the second season. Think, oh hell, how do we how do we top this? Because I I, I don't need to remind you how bad True Detective did in the second season. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was interesting. We we thought um, we, we won so many awards, and we thought, oh my God, um, guys like Tim are going to be laying out there. They're going to be wanting to kill us. <laughs> we we had too much success. We had too much joy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I think we, we approached the second season with, all right, we have a mountain to climb, and, and I'll, I'll go back to what Chris just said. We have a responsibility to this audience. You know, there, there are, I used to call it, like vitamins and minerals that you need to give your audience. They, they give of themselves in a way that we live in a world with infinite choices and incredibly demanding lives. So when you commit, um, what do you get back? So that there's a bond. Um, we're allowed at FX to really take time in our scenes and, and explore moments and allow to have silence. There's we opened this season, Tim and I were just talking about this before the panel started. We open in this 1950s black and white movie and it's just, and, it, and you see the sprockets and the scratches on the film and, and I couldn't believe they would let us open the series. I couldn't either. W w like this, and, and there was never a moment where the network um, even said, we don't know if you can do this. They just said, this is perfectly appropriate for uh, for where you're going this season. Um, so, look, I think there's this incredible bond and trust that you have with the audience, and we talked a lot about how do we satisfy that? How do we, at the end of season one, having invested this time and energy with these characters, allowing the audience to feel a great satisfaction, surprise them, give them things that they do not see coming. Um, uh, scare them, um, shock them, um, but satisfy them. Give them those vitamins and minerals so they do come back. So yeah, it was scary for us, 
to climb that mountain again, particularly not having a lot of the things you normally go to in, well, here's what we know works. Um, and uh, we had reshooting we had to do as we were finding our way. Um, but at the end of the day, we were able to, I think, achieve it. And uh, the early feedback from people like Tim is uh, we did it. Yeah. That, that we climbed the mountain. I think the fascinating thing for you guys as storytellers is, is the um, not playing it safe once you've found something that everybody wants. and Because you, you want to give them that again, but as a storyteller, that would be kind of boring. And I will say that the first five minutes of the second season is a total, complete what-the-fuck moment. Like, watching that, you're just like, what, it, what, is, what even is this? It's just so strange. So when you guys are planning things out, and, and you're thinking, I, I know what the audience wants, but as a storyteller, I want different. How scary is that, and, and, and what's the thinking? Yeah, and different can be a mistake, by the way. Um, but... but we, uh, again, we went back to that, to that book and said, this is another true crime from the Midwest. And um, we'll kiss in by doing the journey of Lou Salverson. But then we, we really locked in on our thematic. And I think that that's critical to know um, for in the creation of your series and then also what the arc for your year is what is your thematic? That's always the place you're going to go back to. And for us, 1979, it's the Walmartization of America. So in our world, uh, of a Fargo world, that means that the Kansas City Crime Syndicate is going to do a hostile takeover of the Gerhardt crime family. Big business, mom and pop. Caught in the middle, Ed and Peggy Blumquist. And... Um, they don't see what's coming, and what erupts is the massacre at Sioux Falls. Those deeply personal stories, absurd events, but also being true to this is a reflection of what was going on in America in the late 70s, and by the way, UFOs. <laughs> yeah, and, and Reagan. But uh, uh, Chris, in, in your second season, I think one of the things that if you, that uh, with the consensus was you sort of made it even better by reinventing sort of like who was running the show and the rules of the characters, then the focus of them changed. So was that, that was, must have been conscious on your part. Uh, I mean, you know, we're lucky a little bit in that we have this kind of runway of technology to, to follow. Uh, and so in many ways, the second season kind of goes where, where the story of technology and progress goes and the character who is very representative of the future and what was next uh, in the first season, you know, therefore is at the steering wheel of the second. Um, but I would just say on like a, a really basic kind of lizard brain place, um, you know, it has to excite you and scare you a little bit. Uh, because, you, you know, it doesn't feel that good in the writer's room to just kind of play the hits, to play the same notes over again. So there is something about new combinations and new moves, and, and you do feel them. I mean, and, and the fact that that works, that you can sit there and everyone can kind of go like, oh, that's kind of, that's weird, but maybe we should try it. Like, I think that has to guide you, uh, and, and that's what protects you from being stale, and that's what protects you, I, I think, from, from failing the other way, because I think it's much better to try those things and have them not work out and make some editing room decisions than to then they go the other way and, and be left with something bland that you have to kind of prop up. So we, we try to make mistakes in that direction when we can. I think also the audience expects more each and every year. You know, given the choices that are out there, the bar, I'm really proud of a lot of things we did in the 90s at NBC, but the complexity of narrative, the exploration of character, to character today, what, what you are presenting to the audiences out there, we don't hold a candle to. It's amazing, to that, actually, to that, You're to right. what we thought was a, a pretty incredible era um, in the '90s. So uh, the bar keeps going up, and that's that's a wonderful, scary place for content creators. Well, there, just quickly, I mean, I think audiences are so smart now. Uh, they are so used to, you know, in movies, the dramatic three-act structure, and in TV, they've seen these moves, you know? So if you're not doing new stuff, 
they're going to get there just as fast as you do. And, and if you see it coming, they will. And I think you have to treat your audience like they're that smart. And I, and, and I think that's what's so exciting about TV right now is you can kind of do anything. You can do five minutes of silence, which, by the way, is like a normal Tuesday on Fargo. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's what's so cool about the moment we're in and you know, not being beholden to these and maybe this is just a, a, a low-rated show talking, but like not being beholden to these huge consensus audiences means you can be a little more art house and a little more risky in, in a way that's awesome and, and probably wasn't true even 10 years ago. I, I got up off my couch when I watched the pilot for Mr. Robot, and I was like, I cheered. I was like, I can't believe this show is on USA, and I can't believe how good it is and how cinematic, and it was just awesome. It, it reinvigorated me. I felt the same thing, and, and you know, for, for USA, they're like, this is who we are. Um, this is the new USA, and let's face it, they all kind of put us to sleep in doing the same thing again and again that they were doing with their programming. They were searching for it, they found it, and that is their declaration to the audience as well as to the creative community to say, we've relaunched ourselves, and you know, that's, that's exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the sort of the surprise and thrilling standout show of the summer because it, it did do so many different things. And like Chris said, it's like you want to you wanna challenge yourself and you know the audience expects things. And the, I don't know if you guys watched Mr. Robot, but there were things in there where they, you could think, oh, this is a twist, but I see it coming. But the creator is like, well, we, we kind of wanted you to see that coming. And then you won't see the one that's right behind it. So that was good. But Simon, I want to ask you, uh, as far as like, having a voice at the end, did you ever like, because you were in the position, like you said, where you got to close things out on your terms, did you ever, when you were sitting down to, to do it, think like, you know what, I didn't, I'm going to do something completely different that I don't, you know what I mean, you had, you had every opportunity there, yeah. you could have really. Yeah, you, you are, I think you, you, I think Chris said it the best, you, you have this responsibility to the audience, and that really does inform a lot of your creative parameter thinking because you do want to push and you do want to surprise and you do want to shock but at the same time you don't want to be um, um, uh, you know a completely different show you don't want to violate that trust and so you find and this is sort of where creativity gets interesting because sometimes the constraints create a whole new kind of creativity than the freedom does and the constraints of a finale a, season, a series finale for example can be limiting extremely limiting because you are honoring the 40 plus hours that came before it, but at the same time you go, oh, well, but I want to leave an impression. I want to do something that, so you have to find this sort of honesty within what you've already done and at the same time push away from it and do something different. If you want to at least entertain at the very least and at the end be trying to leave the audience with something satisfying and have, a, you know, but what was great about the end of Breaking Bad was even though we all knew it was coming, it was still great to watch. And that's an accomplishment because it wasn't predicated on surprise. Right. It was predicated on exactly what we expected, yet it was still immensely satisfying. And I think that's a great lesson because it's he, what Vince did was he stayed in his lane, but he, but he made the lane more interesting and he raised the lane to a new level. And I thought that's kind of the obligation. Uh, and I thought about that a lot at the end of Continuum was like, uh, not that I would ever compare myself to Vince, I think it's a totally different universe, but the, uh, the idea that I can make the show the show, but still do something different. So I think the end, I mean, I can't talk about it, unfortunately, but the end is what the show, I think, people expect, but it's also not what they expect. And that's the fine, that's the fine point you want to put on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what about uh, the, uh, the idea, because we did talk about this crowded field, I mean, is it daunting? Because you're all going to have projects going forward no matter what. I mean as well. I mean, is it daunting to, to sort of like say, okay, now I, you know, I just watched Mr. Robot and that, or I just watched this crazy intro to, or even more than just the intro on, on Fargo and then say, I got to up my game. And it's bipolar actually. There's so many selling opportunities that it's exciting and you can actually sell quite easily because there's this hunger and an appetite to buy on the one hand. On the other hand, you, you're much less aware of what's going to succeed in that environment because when everyone's buying, you realize no one knows what they want <laughs> or they don't know exactly what they're gonna do. So I think there's a bit of a mystery to what may get made and well, how will it, will it succeed versus selling, which is a very different approach. 
And, and, and as far as the having a voice and storytelling and the direction of a series, uh, does it change at all? Because we're we're in this world where you have to keep an odd, not only just f have them find you, but then keep them week to week. Um, well, you know, you <clears throat> you no longer need um, thirty million people to succeed, um, and and so I think uh, strong, authentic voices. Um, buyers, I find, um, when I'm sitting in a room with a, uh, with a creator and a showrunner, um, they want to sense that, that that's the only person on the planet who can bring this idea to life. Mm -hmm. That they're that connected to it, that there's a personal aspect of that idea that really, really touches and speaks to them. And, and then it's kind of the 3 a.m. rule that you, you want to know that on any given morning at 3 a.m., that creator, showrunner, is thinking about how to improve it. How could I possibly tweak what I'm on, this episode, this moment, this scene? Oh my god, that would make it even better. And um, you know, you, you passion sells. Um, ideas that can break through the clutter. Um, yes, big, big creative packages, but inspiration. And 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 I think um, there are a lot of buyers out there that just want to feel like, wow, um, Chris so has this in his head and I want to be a part of putting that out on my platform. Uh, that, that's exciting. That's uh, challenging, but wonderfully exciting today playing in this world. Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, when, when you have something going, uh, you know, you have to play your music. Like, you have to do your show. You have to, you know, that's the part of it you can control is, is how good is that thing that you, you're trying to put out there. But it's an incredibly exciting time in TV just because you do watch things and you know, like, that's what we're chasing or, like, that's the one to beat. I mean, you know, and there'll be these runaway seasons like the first one of Homeland or, or, or Game of Thrones third season or, or Fargo where you're suddenly like, and now you can do that and now that move is out there. And now, like, it, uh, I think it's great. I mean, you have to stay true to your show and not put somebody else or, you know, be trying to catch up to someone else. But I, I think it can also be really invigorating just because... It, the fact that we as people who write TV and make TV can still go home on a Sunday night and, and change our minds about what it can be, I mean, that's that's so cool. Uh, in, I, I think, such a moment we're having, and, uh, you know, we're lucky, and, and I think everything, all ships rise because of that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, it's uh, the, the deeper part, second part of your question, which is also how do you sustain that? For me, it feels like the bigger challenge. I think, conceptually, it's, you can, the excitement of watching what's out right now, makes me want to go pitch great crazy ideas because I feel like, oh, now is the time for this idea to have its place. But then you have your candidate moment where you go, oh, what if what's gonna happen in season four? And I think weirdly some of the some of the ideas that we're formulating now, you have to almost think about them being closed ended, not open ended. And I think the days of the ten season run is maybe not conducive to the way TV is being watched now, and also what people expect from TV. I, I even think that I would have been challenged if I had another two years on Continuum, just in terms of keeping the show fresh, but also in its lane. And I think a lot of shows have shown that propensity to struggle under the fourth or fifth year when it's straight drama, because it's hard to re re evolve within your own, um, within the dynamic you've set up. And sometimes it's baked into the DNA, which is great. Um, sometimes it remains to be seen if it can sustain itself. That's, for me, I think a very, uh, I get a lot of anxiety about like where the show's gonna go. And when someone asks me what happens in season four, I'm like, um, really cool shit. <laughs> yeah, I, it'll, be, it'll be awesome. I, I Donald Trump it. I go, it'll be great. It's gonna be great. You know, the other, uh, when, when we look at a lot of the network fair right now, I think um, there's big, big hooks and um, the difficulty is that they have that machinery and they go out there and, uh, okay, she's, uh, she's naked and she's filled with tattoos and she's in the duffel bag in Times Square and, and that's a very provocative and, and, and NBC brought a, they brought a 
a big audience to sample Blind Spot, and uh, you know every single NFL game that they had, they were promoting the living shit out of it. Um, and and the question is, when you're in that kind of content, not will it open, but can it sustain? Mm -hmm. Ultimately. Um, how many tattoos does she have, Tim? <laughs> are, are those enough tattoos to take you through five seasons? And, uh, you know, uh, so you can get, you, 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 I, you know, are, what are you ultimately buying? Are you buying that big hook? Is that meant to be a more limited experience? Um, or, or is that something that is going to, against an age, um, in a very specific time and place, are we going to explore these characters and see what their lives become as the world around them changes and they are elements of that change? You know, that's sustainable. Um, and if, if, if you just get to that next, keep that going, that's very much sustainable because I'm attached to the characters. But that's creative sustainability, and then there's audience sustainability. And like Hannibal is an example where there seemed like a over over tons of riches of creative sustainability, but not audience sustainability. And they were they were butting into each other, right? So I, it's I think that's the thing: the network model uh, versus the cable model for sure. And then also expectations and promotion. Networks can really hammer it. Uh, in a way that the cable channels just don't do it. So right, it's and th that doesn't always work either. We saw that with Scream Queens with Fox, but you know, promoted it for a year with millions and millions of dollars, and nobody showed up. So it's it's really hard. As, as, versus Halt and Catch Fire, where you, you AMC is not really telling you exactly what you need to to be successful because it's a shifting. The audience is so much smaller. It's just across the board. There's so many people in scripted that. It, it's it's almost like you don't even know. You just have to make your own show. I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, I, I should say they've been great about the fact that you know your job is to make a good show. Your your job is to make a show that resonates with people and, and that feels true. And you know, our job is to to promote and sell that show. That that may be a very kind of simple duality to kind of create, but uh, that's been freeing for us, mm -hmm. at least in that we you know have felt like we don't need to worry about like reaching to a broad audience. And, and they've never said like make these plot moves that might make it more appealing and um, you know I think that's a luxury right now but at the same time you know it, it is hard that you don't get the live viewers and, and you do feel like you know is the show going to get lost before it has a chance to get good and you know I mean that's uh, that is not living in a consensus culture now with, with big shows I mean I, I think that's that's the risk you run because without live viewers you know maybe there isn't the second season. Yeah, it's it's crazy times. Seriously, I mean, it is. Uh, and now we have uh, we have times for some questions from the audience. I'm sure there's plenty. And the mics are coming down. I think on both sides. So we we have a question over there. Uh, this, <clears throat> this question is uh, mostly for Christopher. Um, as someone who's getting into um, TV development on a project uh, with a major production company, can you speak to being a first-time showrunner and maybe sort of the length of the process from pitch to your first season? Uh, did you have a, a mentor, an executive producer that was helping you develop the show? And how do you navigate, yeah, being sort of the yeah it, um, an, an intro into that world? And maybe even Warren can speak as an EP. You know, Noah is someone, as you said, that's not a household name. How do you take that risk on someone that has a really great vision but maybe might be unproven sort of to the, the broader uh, entertainment world? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to give a short answer to, to what is a great but, you know, a, a long answer question, um, you know, your job is to, to get that script in and then to kind of hold on and prove yourself at every stage of the project. So we, we optioned that script. Uh, we developed that script with the help of some great people um, at a production company called Grand Via that also does Breaking Bad and Rectify, and, and they certainly helped us along. Uh, we are giving a new showrunner named Jonathan Lisko for our first season, who, who did act as a mentor and, and really kind of installed the offense of how we run our writer's room. And then in our second season, we co-show ran, and in our third season, my writing partner and I would show run on our own. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you're you're wise to go with it, but at every stage you're being evaluated, and, and you should know that, and you know, the only way to kind of ride the bear is to be passionate about it. Uh, and the great news is, if you created it and you love it, you really care. Uh, you, you, you give a fuck about the fourth costume change on the fifth day player, and you have to, and that's the key to show running. Uh, that's, that's the hardest thing to do, is to, to 
renew your interest and your desire to weigh in and your desire to have a, an opinion, uh, for me at least. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, does that answer your question? I mean, I think it, it really is about kind of checking in at each stage and, and making sure you're passionate because that's the piece of it you're being asked to supply. Uh, and if you don't have that, then the rest of it kind of doesn't matter. And don't react. Don't react. You're going to want to react to everything. Uh, don't do it. Like, just to count to 10. <laughs> Um, like, for like in breaking in, um, you know, I, I did a, uh, a very short-lived series um, at ABC with uh, Noah Hawley called uh, My Generation. And um, uh, it was a Swedish format um, that I found and, and brought to him. And, and it became clear to me in working with Noah that um, he was ready. He had never... Um, he had never had someone over him before, um, and you know, so I was his advocate at the network to say he doesn't need a a showrunner over him. You know, I'm I'm his partner, but there's no writer going to be over Noah. He's he's ready. He's learned. He's grown, and it's his time. Um, and they were passionate uh, for. Uh, well, they were passionate enough to pick up the show and put it on. It lasted two episodes, and, and then they weren't so passionate. Um, and then it was gone, but what was clear to me is that Noah absolutely had arrived as an artist, uh, as a showrunner with vision. Um, and, and so I would say you want um, to align yourself with someone who's experienced, who has the... You know, you're, you're handing over, these, these companies are handing over millions of dollars every week to create this content and put it on their air. So they want to be assured that, that all kinds of things are in place before they turn that over. It's not unreasonable. So yeah, you package yourself with experienced people and then like a Noah Hawley, when you have the goods, when you deliver the goods, then no one will seek to put someone over you. Um, Simon doesn't need that. Chris doesn't need that now. But but that's what you do in order to establish yourself. The question I had was also a little bit starting with, with Christopher. Um, I was really interested in the way that AMC um, gave your show to Netflix before the second season started so that people could binge the first season and catch up. And, and that seemed great. And uh, It seemed like a new thing. Was that something you discussed or they discussed with you or they just decided to do that? They, uh, AMC has a long history of, uh, you know, working with Netflix. I, I, and I think they'll credit the popularity in many ways of Break, Breaking Bad and Mad Men to, to the fact that those things got on Netflix, were not much watched in their early seasons live, and then people kind of discovered them and really showed up for the later seasons. Um, you know, so luckily that, that partnership was kind of in place by the time Hunt Gets Fire came along. But even in financing, uh, you know, Netflix paid for uh, one of the seasons of The Killing. And, and I know there, you know, there is a possibility where a Halt and Catch Fire season three would, you know, be partially paid for by Netflix. So I, I think that's a great relationship that those two entities have and, and really reflects the way we watch TV now, which is we, we want to be able to come into a third season show, but we, we don't want to have to go back and kind of buy all the individual episodes. And um, so, uh, you know, I'm grateful we're living in a time where you can stream and binge and, and catch up. I have another question for Christopher. Unlike Simon and Warren, your show follows a history of the technology world. How hard is it to stay current and relative and have that creative dialogue while still being true to the actual events that happened? Um, I mean, it, you know, it, it's important to us at Halt and Catch Fire not be an alternate history. So you, you want to fly within the structures of what really happened. You want to have the the choices people make have the right consequences historically. But at the end of the day, uh, it's got to be a show about the characters and the people. So uh, you start there. Um, beyond that, though, I would, what was, I'm sorry, what was the second half of your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the great opportunity I think you have with a period show especially is that you can address kind of modern issues through a period lens that, that kind of makes them a little less scary. So like 
Gamergate was something we were super interested in this year in the Hong Kitch Fire, the writer room. It's We have two women at the head of a technology company, and, and what do they face? Um, so I think you can do startup problems, things that came out of, like we were all reading Fast Company, we were all reading these these kind of startup blogs and trying to inject that culture into what we're talking about, even though the show is set in 1985. So um, I, I love that about doing a period show. I mean, it's a production nightmare, obviously, to ever go outside, but um, I think it makes things, you know, things that are hard to talk about now feel safer when we put them in a, in a period context, and so that, that was the wonderful thing we got to do. And just point out, Continuum is historically accurate. You just have to be looking at it from 2077. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Simon. I'm most of the way through Continuum now and just have been obviously struck by how deep and complex the mythology is and have always wondered how much that plays into the pitch at the beginning, especially in a post-lost era where you have to worry about pulling all of these strands together. Um, is this something that you had very planned out from the, from the beginning that the network wanted to know, or were you figuring it out as you went along? It's an excellent question, and I'll, t I'll tell you why it's an excellent question, which is a little bit of a bonus part. The, the sales part of a show is this very unique uh, conundrum, because the buyer wants to see in the in the fabric of the pilot, essentially representation of every episode. And, but with a show that is built on a mythology, you can't actually do that in the pilot. It's impossible. So in a way, you go in with a knowledge of mythology uh, as a afterthought to answer questions, but you don't necessarily have to pitch it. And I guess the example in context for you would be the, um, the network was much more interested in the setup you know, the, the, the as, as it's called, the uh, premise part of the pitch. What's the, where's this character from? What's happened to her? What does she want? And much less interested in where it was going down the road. They get, I think the buyer gets hooked into that part much more than they do the mythology. Uh, later, though, the mythology becomes a conversation that comes up because you start as, a, as writers, and once we all got together the first season, what did we want to talk about? Well, we already knew what the show was. We already knew what was baked in. It, she's from the future. She wants to stop terrorists. She wants to get home. So we had this, the only stuff to talk about that was new was the mythology, was wh where, what's the backstories? What is this going to mean? What are the themes? And so as we developed the first season, slowly the broadcaster then starts recognizing mythology as you develop it, and then they start asking the questions that are the, the awkward questions. Where is this going? So it's a very interesting dance, because you, on the one hand, you, um, I could, and it's funny, Warren and I are actually experiencing this right now with this book series. It's insanely big in mythology. It's insanely big in scope. And the temptation is to walk into the broadcaster and lay the table first of the world so that the story has value and stakes of the characters. But as Warren has taught me, and he's probably the smartest guy I know right now, uh, <laughs> I should, I should. It's a small I world should, you've been in, Simon. <laughs> no, but it's true. He, he keeps my eye. I'm, I'm, my tendency is to do everything. Um, but Warren's great because he says, no, Simon, you, you don't have to sell the universe. You don't have to sell all the mythology. Sell the, the character story. Just focus on that. And that's, that's really good for me to have someone who's keeping my eye on that. Because as a showrunner, I have to be everywhere. And your, and your instinct is to be everywhere because you wanna, I want to see it. And I can't sell it if I don't already see the finished show. So that becomes part of your process. But what Warren's talking about is really what the buyer, I think, wants as well. And what the audience ultimately shows up for and week in, week out. And that's character journey. Um, oftentimes, a lot of uh, writers uh, that will be preparing uh, the, that pilot pitch, and they'll try and lay out in the pitch the pilot story. And it's like, you know what? There'll be, after they buy it, there'll be lots of meetings to fight about and navigate the pilot story. We're selling a character's journey. We're selling the series, right? Not to get too hung up in long-term architecture, but that's what you want to bite into. And um, you don't want to spend all that time because, yeah, you got 25 minutes. That's about it. 
That's the maximum amount of time you're going to say after you've talked about weather and real estate in Los Angeles. You've got 25 minutes to have them leaning forward, totally engaged, and wanting to know what's going to happen with those characters. And, and that's what your focus should be. But you should know it. Know it. Know the mythology. You just don't feel obliged to and sell And that it. comes up in the Q&A after. Well, maybe we'll be uh, here in Vancouver talking about that show uh, in the future. Hopefully we will, and hopefully it'll be good, right? Hopefully it won't suck. Okay, yes, Tim. It won't suck. Um, I'm sure Tim will let you know. I'll let you it's know. It's going to be huge. Yeah, I'll just let you know. Um, it's going to be huge. <laughs> it's going to be huge. Uh, and then also, maybe we'll all pay attention to what happens at AMC for Christopher's show. Um, it's good. Such a great story. Thanks for thanks for sharing that, that, that you're waiting. That was a great uh, heartbeat to this panel. Uh, and lastly, don't forget to tune in and watch season two of uh, Fargo. And uh, let's give these guys a hand for coming out tonight. <laughs> <laughs>